You ever have that feeling where you're not sure if you're awake or you're still dreaming? I know exactly what you mean. I'm aware that there's still some who would question or even justify the offense of 9-11. These are not opinions to be debated. These are facts to be dealt with. Well, there are many, many ways to think of it, but historically, have governments ever faked incidents or incited incidents in order to get them into war? I'm saying that, 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 that in America we are fed propaganda, and if you want to know what's happening in the world, go outside of the U.S. media, because it's owned by four corporations. One of them is this one. And you know what? Go outside of the country to find out what's going on in our own country, because it's frightening. It's frightening. Even though the government never explained how the towers came down the way they did and never tested for explosives. And you know that building seven, a high rise, not Alex, a high Alex I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there and ask you a question. We're, we've been getting a lot of calls lately on this show from people who believe that 9 11 uh, was, um, there's like a, a theory that it was an, an inside job. Uh, is this, are you part of a, a group or an effort that's trying to get this on the show? Well, actually, I've, I've read um, in Homeland Security training brochures that 9-11 truth activists are potential terrorists. And I guess that means that my email records are among those that the government feels it can read and review. And I suppose that under the NDA, I could be indefinitely detained. And that has me concerned. Well, Alex, can you answer my question about if this is a group effort? Are you part of an organization or anything? I'm, I'm an American citizen. To find a way of being able to get total control of people's minds. The right track is don't believe anybody. Okay. Don't believe me. Don't believe George Bush. Don't believe anyone. You got to go out and you got to get proof in your hand before you can believe anything. And to do otherwise today is, is the biggest mistake that anyone can ever make. Um, you begin believing people, uh, putting your trust in them that they're telling you the truth. I guarantee you, you're going to take a ride on a roller coaster you don't want to be on. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine, and live with pink haired strippers, managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000 foot descending 270 degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground, hitting the Pentagon in the budget analyst office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10th, 2001. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions.
Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. The administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. He said that he saw a helicopter circle the building. He said that it appeared to be a U.S. military helicopter and that it disappeared behind the building where the helicopter landing zone is. He then saw a fireball uh, go into the sky. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination. Because... Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government could envision flying airplanes into buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on able danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. The SEC destroyed their records on the investigation into the insider trading before the attacks, but that's okay because destroying the records of the largest investigation in SEC history is just part of routine record keeping. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC-7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. The FBI has argued that all material related to their investigation of 9-11 should be kept secret from the public, but that's okay because the FBI probably has nothing to hide. This man never existed, nor is anything he had to say worthy of your attention, and if you say otherwise, you are a paranoid conspiracy theorist and deserve to be shunned by all of humanity. Likewise him, 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 and her. And her, and her, and him. My name is again. Her name is Sibel Edmonds. We turn now to Sibel Edmonds. I'm talking about those, those people who made decisions not to act on certain translations, certain intelligence pieces before 9-11 and after 9-11. They haven't mentioned anybody who actually is connected to Al-Qaeda in mid or higher level. Muslim Arab, Arab type fellows, and uh, what you're about to hear is, uh, is, is very disturbing. He claimed he met three of the 9-11 hijackers in Shreveport a year before the attacks. This morning, local dentist David Graham is dead after the family says he was poisoned more than two years ago. At the time, Graham was trying to publish a manuscript about meeting three Middle Easterners in Shreveport. He feared they were plotting to bomb Barksdale. Graham wrote that he warned the FBI. Then after 9-11, he saw their pictures among the hijackers. And I said, I wanna, I'm, I'm an asset who covered Iraq and Libya at the United Nations, and I have a story to tell, and you need to hear what I have to say. And within 30 days, I woke up to hear the FBI pounding at my door. You are Susan Lindauer, you are hereby notified, you are under arrest on the Patriot Act. That began a, a five-year indictment. In five years, I was allowed one morning of testimony with two witnesses former chief of staff for a congressional member of Congress and Park Godfrey who verified the 9-11 warnings. My name is Kurt Sonnenfeld. For 10 years I worked for several different agencies of the United States government including the Federal Emergency Management Agency. In September of 2001 I was contracted to be the official videographer uh, following the attacks on Ground Zero of the World Trade Center. Because of the conclusions of what I saw and what I filmed, my life has been in danger for the past 10 years. Now, I live in Argentina as a political refugee. I used to be in charge of the visa section at the CIA's consulate at Jeddah, the principal city of the Hejaz in western Saudi Arabia. There, for a year and a half, I issued visas to terrorists recruited by the CIA and its asset, Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. 
Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. This is the story of 9-11, brought to you by the media which told you the hard truths about His head could be seen to move violently forward. And They took the babies out of incubators. And Mobile production facilities. And The rescue of just a lynch. If you love your country and or freedom, happiness, rainbows, rock and roll, puppy dogs, apple pie, and your grandma, you will never ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. Our understanding of what has already happened in Syria is grounded in facts, informed by conscience, and guided by common sense. Anyone who could claim that an attack of this staggering scale could be contrived or fabricated needs to check their conscience and their own moral compass. Anyone conscience and their own moral compass. Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> nope, no weapons over there. <laughs> Maybe under here. <laughs> the main reason we went into Iraq at the time was we thought he had weapons of mass destruction. It turns out he didn't. What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. <laughs> Nothing. Turns out President George W. Bush was right about Saddam Hussein hiding weapons of mass destruction. When you found out there were no weapons of mass destruction, can you bring me to that moment? Did someone walk in and say, we've stopped looking, they're not no. there? No. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful. And so were we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. I just want to ask what your message is to the Iraqi people who are working. You're free, and freedom is beautiful. And, uh, you know, it'll take time to restore chaos and order, but we order out of chaos, but we will. Yeah, John. We have an obligation to every last victim of this illegal aggression because all of this carnage has been done in our name. Since World War II, 90% of the casualties of war are unarmed civilians, a third of them children. Our victims have done nothing to us. From Palestine to Afghanistan to Iraq to Somalia to wherever our next target may be, their murders are not collateral damage. They are the nature of modern warfare. They don't hate us because of our freedoms. They hate us because every day we are funding and committing crimes against humanity. The so-called war on terror is a cover for our military aggression to gain control of the resources of Western Asia. This is sending the poor of this country to kill the poor of those Muslim countries. This is trading blood for oil. This is genocide. And to most of the world, we are the terrorists. In these times, remaining silent on our responsibility to the world and its future is criminal. And in light of our complicity in the supreme crimes against humanity in Iraq and Afghanistan, and ongoing violations of the UN Charter and international law, how dare any American criticize the actions of legitimate resistance to illegal occupation? Our so-called enemies in Afghanistan, Iraq, Palestine, our other colonies around the world, and our inner cities here at home are struggling against the oppressive hand of empire, demanding respect for their humanity. They are labeled insurgents or terrorists for resisting rape and pillage by the white establishment, but they are our brothers and sisters in the struggle for justice. The civilians at the other end of our weapons don't have a choice, but American soldiers have choices. And while there may have been some doubt five years ago, today we know the truth. Our soldiers don't sacrifice for duty, honor, country. They sacrifice for Kellogg, Brown, and Root. They don't fight for America. They fight for their lives and their buddies beside them because we put them in a war zone. They're not defending our freedoms. They're laying the foundation for 14 permanent military bases to defend the freedoms of ExxonMobil and British Petroleum. 
They're not establishing democracy. They're establishing the basis for an economic occupation to continue after the military occupation has ended. Iraqi society today, thanks to American help, is defined by house raids, death squads, checkpoints, detentions, curfews, blood in the streets, and constant violence. We must dare to speak out in support of the Iraqi people who resist and endure the horrific existence we brought upon them through our bloodthirsty imperial crusade. We must dare to speak out in support of those American war resistors, the real military heroes who uphold their oath to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, including those terrorist cells in Washington, D.C., more commonly known as the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. Frederick Douglass said, those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. Every one of us, every one of us must keep demanding, keep fighting, keep thundering, keep plowing, keep speaking, keep struggling until justice is served. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. I lost my husband, my son, my uncle, my nephew, on September 11th, 2001. Most people don't know a third tower fell that day. The government says fire brought it down. The collapse of World Trade Center 7 was primarily due to fires. I, along with 1,400 other architects and engineers, have found the government's conclusion to be physically impossible. This is Building 7, a 47-story skyscraper that fell on the afternoon of September 11th. The government says that fire brought it down. However, 1,500 architects and engineers concluded it was a controlled demolition. I'm a structural engineer. I'm a New York City correction officer. I'm an Air Force pilot. Well, I'm an architect of 20 years, mm -hmm. member of the American Institute of Architects, and have been studying steel-framed, fireproof buildings uh, for about that long. Fires in high-rises have never brought down a steel frame high-rise building at all, ever. In the case of Building 7, it collapses straight down into its own footprint at free-fall speed in the there, first the hundred feet. It's dropping, as you can see, symmetrically, smoothly, at free-fall speed in the first hundred feet, two and a half seconds. This is uncanny. There's 40,000 tons of structural steel designed to resist this collapse. World Trade Center 7 collapsed because of fires fueled by office furnishings. It did not collapse from explosives or from fuel oil fires. Here is a 47-story skyscraper. At 5.20 in the afternoon, it drops like a rock, and I mean this fast. Free fall acceleration, straight down, uniformly, symmetrically. Now, a building with 40,000 tons of structural steel cannot fall straight down without all 80 columns on each floor being removed simultaneously and then synchronistically timed floor by floor. The CIA had an undercover office in Seven World Trade Center. A U.S. official tells CNN the office was involved in counterterrorism and counterintelligence. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. And I turned in time to see uh, what looked like a skyscraper implosion. It looked like it had been done by a demolition crew. The whole thing just collapsing down on itself. We heard this this sound that sounded like a clap of thunder. Well, it looked like there was um, a shockwave uh, ripping through the building and the windows all uh, busted out. It was almost as if it were a planned implosion. It just Pancaked. Pancaking almost like a precision implosion. Ironically, the building had housed the city's emergency management office. I don't know whether it was, whether it was uh, accomplished by uh, demolition experts. Watching an old building being demolished, and they wired very carefully for days, and it's a very careful operation in order to make sure that the building comes down safely. That's what it looks like happened to Building 7. I certainly am much more open-minded about it than I was, and it is because of the involvement of the 9-11 families and all these engineers and architects. This is Building 7 in the World Trade Center uh, area is, is collapsing. Uh, now, now whether, uh, we, don't, we, we don't even know whether this was uh, something that was uh, engineered for safety reasons or it just happened. Can you confirm it was number 7 that just went in? Yes, sir. 
Um, and you were you guys knew this was coming all day. We had been had we had heard reports that the building was unstable and that it eventually would either come down on its own or it would be taken down. We all thought for sure a bomb was set to explode underneath our feet outside Seven World Trade Center. It was a an abrupt, total and complete collapse at the speed of free fall. They told us the Link 7 was coming down. I do believe that they brought the Link 7 down because I heard that they were going to bring it down. Did they actually use the word brought down and who was it that was telling you this? In the fire department and um, they did use the word we're gonna have to bring it we're gonna have to bring it down. Right now we're told that uh, seven World Trade uh, building is being evacuated. You got to stay behind this line because they're thinking about taking this building down. Building seven came down. Many emergency vehicles making their way into Manhattan, including one thing we see if we show the video here, so a demolition truck carrying construction equipment. That okay, that equipment is going towards presumably down to uh, downtown. We are getting information now that one of the other buildings, building seven, in the World Trade Center complex is on fire and has either collapsed or is collapsing. The 47-story Salomon Brothers building, situated very close to the World Trade Center, has also just collapsed. More on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing. And indeed it has. Tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse. As you can see behind me, the... Uh... Presumably there were very few people in the Salomon building when it collapsed. We are getting word from New York right now that another building has collapsed. I understand that this is a 47-story building on a Tuesday. That uh, information, of course, take a look at that right-hand side of the screen. It's going down it. right now. There it is. Yep. It went down right there. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull, and then we watched the building collapse. World Trade Center 7, the leaseholder of the World Trade Center complex, Larry Silverstein, he said that they pulled that building, which is a demolition term for intentionally bringing down a building. I remember it was, it was in danger, and I think that they made a decision based on the danger that it had of destroying other things, that they did it in a controlled fashion. We've got to rebuild seven World Trade Center, and we've got to do it fast. Next thing you know, We've got the designs of a building. And the first design meeting was in April of 2000. And construction began shortly thereafter in 2002. We're backed by 9-11 family members and other concerned citizens who are calling for an independent, unbiased investigation. As an engineer, I have three degrees in engineering. I signed that petition for architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth some time ago because the American people absolutely need the truth of 9-11. I'm a family member trying to find out the answers to the murder of 3,000 plus people. It's distressing for everyone to come to terms with this evidence, but we must pursue the truth wherever it leads. Look at the evidence and decide for yourself. Of course, our focus is on the science of what happened. We want to know how did 400 structural steel connections give way every second during the seven second free fall collapse of World Trade Center 7. On the upper levels, the fires had reached temperatures of 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperatures inside could have built up to 15, 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. Upon impact, 10,000 gallons of jet fuel shot through the building, pouring down elevator shafts and stairwells. Entire floors ignited in a raging 1,600 degree fire in mere seconds. At 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, it's hot enough to weaken the steel structure. Trapped in a mounting inferno, 
that would reach 1,800 degrees. High up in both towers, the raging fires were now generating three to five times the heat of a nuclear power plant. And the interior temperature had soared in places to nearly 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The nearly 2,000 degree temperature would eventually take its toll. Jet fuel had burned fiercely as high as 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but not for long. Corley's team estimates that as much as a third of the fuel explodes outside of the building. What remains inside burns for only eight minutes. The steel holding the tower up was reaching temperatures higher than 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. The fire inside the tower's main have reached temperatures of 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. A fire broke out last night in the World Trade Center. The fire began in an electrical wiring closet on the 11th floor. The fire spread to six other floors. There was also no sprinkler system in the building. Even without a sprinkling system, fire department officials and building officials here say that there's no chance the World Trade Center could become a type of towering inferno. The building was designed to have a fully loaded 707 crash into it. That was the largest plane at the time. I believe that the building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners. The designers of the Trade Center tried to anticipate every possible disaster. The towers were the first skyscrapers ever explicitly built to survive the impact of a plane. We had designed the project for the impact of the our largest airplane of its time, that is to take this jet airplane, run it into the building, destroy a lot of structure, and still have it stand up. After months of analysis, NIST concluded that the World Trade Center had no structural flaws that could account for its collapse. These buildings were sound, well-designed, highly innovative. Never has a steel structure building in the history of steel structured buildings ever fallen down for the reasons of fire. These outer columns, tied closer together than was normal at the time, could withstand the impact of a Boeing 707. Though the plane would destroy some of the columns, the building would still remain standing. Because the fuel, it just melted the steel. The idea of putting subliminal messages in the ads is, is ridiculous. Conspiracy theories abound in uh, American politics. Uh, I don't think we need to be subliminal, subliminal messages.
him. Larry Silverstein is a great guy. He's a good guy. He's a friend of mine. Larry Silverstein is a terrific owner in New York and a very good friend of mine who I just called. I was very worried about him because I assume maybe he was in the building. He took possession of the building one week ago. As you know, he just bought the World Trade Center. Right. And uh, he was in his office and he was getting ready to move into the World Trade Center over the next two weeks. So, and I just spoke to him. Where were you on September 11th? Um, you know, uh, I was home. Um, and I, the only reason I wasn't where I was every morning, uh, subsequent to the 26th day of July, um, I was, my, my mornings were spent, um, usually at a breakfast meeting at Windows, an eight o'clock breakfast meeting, Windows, the top sure. of it, right? mm -hmm. and then going down to visit with my tenants, my new tenants, um, uh, at the trade center, getting to know them, understanding their problems and so forth, ascertaining how I could, how we could service their needs better. Um, and, uh, which is a first, first, one of the first things you do when you acquire a property, you begin to meet your peep, meet your tenants and start talking with them. Um, and so my mornings were spent at the trade center and then by noon I was back uptown. And, uh, um, and so that particular morning, uh, because I have, I call it hair and fair skin, and uh, I'm a annuity to the dermatologist. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife, God bless her, had made an appointment for me uh, at the doctor. And I remember dressing to go to the doctor. I finally saying to my wife, I said, sweetheart, I've got so much to do downtown. I've got to cancel this. I've got to go downtown. And she said, you're not going to cancel this appointment. You're going to the dermatologist. And you know, having been married now for, to the same woman for 46 years, you, you get the sense of determination on occasion, their voices. And I said, okay, okay, yes, dear, I'll go. I'll go. And then just minutes later, I uh, received a telephone call to turn on a television set and witnessed this horrendous circumstance. Um, the first plane hitting and then the second plane hitting, of course, with the second hit. Uh, it became obvious that this was terrorism. Uh, my children, two of my children, uh, Roger and Lisa, both work with me. Uh, they were on their way to work at 9 o'clock. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, had the plane struck 15 minutes later, uh, our firm would have been decimated. obligation to collect the insurance proceeds from the policies. I'm going to get you the money. And in six months, he got me the four and a half billion dollars. The insurance companies didn't like me, but at least I got the money. And it took five years. We got the four and a half billion dollars. Three of it we gave to the Port Authority. Haven't, haven't, I, haven't I earned my, my keep? Haven't I earned my peace at this point? The Israeli newspaper Ma'ariv has reported Israel's former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has publicly said the September 11th attacks have been good for Israel. Netanyahu said, quote, we're benefiting from one thing, and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and the American struggle in Iraq. Vote for Benjamin, terrific guy, terrific leader, great for Israel. I wrote a book in 1995 and I said that if, it, if the West doesn't wake up to the suicidal nature of militant Islam, the next thing you'll see uh, is uh, the militant Islam is bringing down the World Trade Center. Trump's book, published back in the year 2000, warning of such an attack, Trump wrote, I really am convinced we're in danger of the sort of terrorist attacks that will make the bombing of the 1993 Trade Center look like little kids playing with firecrackers. Trump also mentioned the mastermind of the attack, writing, quote, one day we're told that a shadowy figure with no fixed address named Osama bin Laden is public enemy number one and U.S. jet fighters lay waste to his camp in Afghanistan. He escapes back under some rock and a few news cycles later, it's onto a new enemy 
economy and a new crisis. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such a terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. We've got to rebuild several trade center, and we've got to do it fast. Next thing you know, we've got the designs of a building. And the first design meeting was in April of 2000. And construction began shortly thereafter in 2002. The attacks on the Twin Towers, uh, never to be the same again. The man they credit with Donald Trump's victory, the president-elect's own son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Jared Kushner has the power in the White House. I mean, well, you, he, you, he, is, he is the most powerful person in the White House next to the president. Can I reveal, Jared, how long we've known you? <laughs> well, he, he was never small. He was always big. <laughs> he was always tall. But I've, I've known the president and I've known his family and his team for a long time. Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> nope, no weapons over there. <laughs> Maybe under here. <laughs> the main reason we went into Iraq at the time was we thought he had weapons of mass destruction. It turns out he didn't. What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. <laughs> Nothing. Pentagon. The day before 9-1-1, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld declared war. Not on foreign terrorists. He said money wasted by the military poses a serious threat. Rumsfeld promised change. But the next day, the world changed. The military cannot account for 25% of what it already spends. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. $2.3 trillion, with a T. That's $8,000 for every man, woman, and child in America. To understand how the Pentagon can lose track of trillions... From my close-up inspection, uh, there's no evidence of a plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. The only site uh, is the actual uh, site of the building that's crashed in. And as I said, the only pieces left uh, that you can see are, are small enough that you could pick up in your hand. Uh, there are no large uh, tail sections, wing sections, uh, a fuselage, nothing like that anywhere around, which would indicate that the entire plane crashed into the side of the Pentagon uh, uh, and then cause the side to collapse. Now, even though if you look at the pictures of the Pentagon, you see uh, that the floors have all collapsed. That didn't happen immediately. Uh, it wasn't until a, almost about 45 minutes later uh, that the structure was weakened enough that all of the floors collapsed. When I was uh, standing in front of the Pentagon that night, seeing one of our uh, fortresses pried open by a missile a airplane. You can see the different layers, one, two, three, four, five layers in, the, you know, the, the different uh, uh, rings, they call them, leading into the atrium of the, uh, of the Pentagon. And the first three, E, D, and C, were penetrated by the... Uh Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings on such a massive scale. Uh, Counterterrorism forecaster Marvin Citron authored a report in 1994 for the Department of Defense. We predicted a plane could have crashed into the Pentagon. That's about as specific as you can be. Noel Cook is a former Pentagon counterterrorism chief. Just this June, he authored a report warning that an attack of this kind was imminent. In a bizarre coincidence, two Pentagon employees counted as missing were actually passengers on the terrorist planes. 
one that hit the Pentagon, the other, the World Trade Center. 9.15 after the second plane hits the World Trade Center, the Pentagon puts together a crisis action team to assess any additional threats. So the Pentagon sucked in the airplane, so we didn't see any more part or any pieces of the airplane. A piece around. of the aircraft actually landed and broke your windshield, as I understand. Uh, just landed by the car. And uh, this is one of them. Lloyd England was driving his taxi cab next to the Pentagon when Flight 77 flew over him. Lloyd England wasn't just a witness, he was also a survivor. He very nearly died on one of the roads behind me. England was behind the wheel of his cab that September day, driving near the Pentagon. The plane was so low it hit the pole. When it hit the pole it knocked the light part off. And nothing came through the pole, to, through the car, but the pole itself. The light pole shaft speared its way through England's cab, pushing the passenger side of his seat backwards into the rear of the car. A few feet to the right, and England would have been crushed. So I had to wrestle with the car to stop it. My name is Lloyd England. I looked at, at, the, at the Pentagon, and there was no debris left. I mean, if a plane, I'm, I'm wondering now, what happened to the airplane? There's a hole in the building, but the hole is not big as the airplane. The tail section would be taller than the hole. The wings spread, I mean the wings, man the wings, the big engines underneath each wing. Nothing was left out of the plane. I mean, how's a plane going to completely go into a building and nothing be left out? But there wasn't a big hole. You know, I mean, it's big enough hole for me to drive my truck through, but it wasn't big enough hole for that plane to go in. I mean, unless something happened that I'm not familiar with, that I don't understand about physics, plane couldn't go in that hole. I didn't see a plane hit the Pentagon. I wonder where the plane went. No, I wasn't supposed to be involved in this. This is too big for me, man. This is a big thing. Man, you know, this is, this is the world thing happening. I'm a small man, you know? My lifestyle is completely different from this. Right. I'm not supposed to be involved in this. This is for other people, people who have money and all this kind of stuff. But you said, wait, what do you mean? I'm not supposed to be involved in this. I don't have nothing. So your point that these people that have all the money... This is their thing. This is, this is their event. This, this, is, this is for them. Meaning they're, they're doing it for their own reasons. That's right. right. I'm not supposed to be in it. But they used you, right? I'm in it. You're in it. Yeah, we came, we came across the highway together. You and their event. That's right. But, but they must have planned that. It was planned. They meant for you to be there, didn't they? No. No, they, they didn't mean for me to be there. You know what his story is? That's what I said. You gotta, you gotta understand what you're saying. His, his story. story. It's his story. Absolutely. It's not the truth. It's his story. Right. It has nothing to do with the truth. Nope. It's his story. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. It appears that a bomb was detonated uh, at the heliport right next to the uh, Pentagon. Something started to fire with some explosion at the Pentagon not long after the two World Trade Centers were hit. Hey, I just heard an, another explosion of some sort. Now, it could be a secondary explosion here from something happening, but we just heard a loud pop just as you were coming to me. It seemed to be on the uh, east of here. I can't tell what it is. It might be something that's secondary to this sure. because we had a number of small explosions after the fire occurred. I have heard uh, a total of three booms, that initial boom, and then I heard um, three l less, less uh, large booms, but booms nonetheless. Have you, have you heard the same thing? Yes, I did. I did. If you can hear me, we just heard another explosion down at the Pentagon building. We just heard another loud explosion. We did hear two lesser explosions. The first one came about 10 minutes after the initial big explosion that we saw. And then there was another one, I would say, and this is a rough estimate here, about a half hour later. Now, again, those explosions, though, they were different than that original explosion. The original explosion, as we felt it and heard it and, and saw the huge cloud, um, those, that was a, quite a, a strong explosion. These other ones, you heard it, but then when you looked at the area, you didn't see anything that was different. 
Uh, I should tell you that I started out the day uh, with the Secretary of Defense and the Deputy Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon uh, at the very moment uh, that these attacks occurred on the World Trade Center. I was with Don Rumsfeld and Paul Wolfowitz in the Secretary's private dining room. Ironically, we were discussing uh, the threats, the new threats that are emerging that America is facing, and the Secretary had said literally moments before the Pentagon itself was hit that there will be another event. And he said it twice for emphasis there will be another event. It's Secretary Rumsfeld, I understand that he raced over to the Pentagon as soon as he heard about this. In fact, helped put some of the people on stretchers. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld was concerned. We were told yesterday that apparently when he did find out his office is on the north side of the Pentagon. The, uh, the jetliner crashed into the south side. A lot of people on the north side, frankly, didn't feel anything or hear anything, and that's how vast the Pentagon is and, and, and just how widespread it is. But in any case, when Rumsfeld was told that there was a problem, there was a fire, he apparently came outside, tried to help some of the rescuers, tried to get some of the people out of the wreckage, was then very quickly taken back inside in the National Military Command Center, this very secure bunker, in order to coordinate uh, possible responses and consult with the president and the vice president. It looks like there's nothing there except for a hole in the ground. Uh, basically, that's right. The only thing you could see from where we were uh, was a big gouge in the earth and some broken trees. Any large pieces of debris at all? No, there was nothing, nothing that you could distinguish that a plane had crashed there. How big would you say that hole was? Uh, from my estimates, I would guess it was probably about 20 to 15 feet. Uh, long and a, probably about 10 feet long or 10 feet wide. What could you see on the ground, if anything, other than dirt and ash? And you couldn't see anything. You could just see dirt, ash, and people walking around, broken trees. Nothing was there. No wreckage. No fire. Little pieces of metal. There wasn't anything there, but little pieces of metal. No piece of wreckage was larger than a telephone book. No identifiable bodies were found. How little debris is visible. That's really all you see is a large crater in the ground and, and just tiny, tiny bits of debris. There has been at least one report that the uh, investigators out there, and there are hundreds of them, as I said tonight, um, have found nothing larger than a phone book. Debris from that crash has been located miles and miles away from the crash scene. Well, the FBI and the state police here have confirmed that they have cordoned off a second area about six to eight miles away from the crater here where this plane went down. This is apparently another debris site, which raises a number of questions. Why would debris from the plane, and they identified it specifically as being from this plane, why would debris be located six miles away? Could it have blown that far away? Seems highly unlikely. And then all of a sudden they're telling us six miles away, they have another concentration of debris. They say it's very small pieces. Most of these are very small pieces. Most of the pieces here are no bigger than the size of a briefcase, they say. Mm -hmm. And the pieces six miles away may be even smaller than that. So you can say this is not typical for a plane crash to be spread across an area this large. It certainly doesn't make sense. Today, investigators found debris from the crash in a neighborhood about eight miles away from the area where the plane went down. They say the debris was scattered by the wind. And then about six miles away up by a lake, there is another area that's been cordoned off. Hmm. And state police and the FBI have said definitely there is debris from the plane located there. All that you really see there is a huge crater. You can't even see it very well from our vantage point. A huge black gaping hole, as investigators are describing it. There is a lot of debris, most of it very small pieces of black charred. There you see the crater, and there you can see, Peggy, just the, the tiniest bits of, of white debris, and there's really nothing left of that plane. Witnesses have said that they saw the plane actually flying upside down with the tail down, and that it plunged into the earth at at least a 60-degree angle, possibly straight down, which would account for the small crater, about uh, 20 feet around and at least 10 or 20 feet deep. The uh, bulk of the remains of that plane and all the 45 people who are on board may be buried deep in that crater uh, just in the field beyond these trees here. From what I saw in, uh, at the initial impact were very small pieces that you would not recognize as being part of the plane. What evidence is in the crater? So to the naked eye, there's not a whole lot there now. That's why we have archaeologists who are here on scene and will be working on that site so that we can properly recover that information. By the time they got there, he said there was virtually nothing left of that plane. He said the, uh, in fact, a couple of people have told us that, that the biggest piece of debris they found down there was, in fact, about five feet uh, long, and that was it. Everything else uh, just uh, um, 
you know, just debris scattered throughout the area, and they've uh, they roped off the scene, and the FBI is down there processing it now. So they're not letting any press anywhere near this scene right now. People who went to the scene, we spoke to one eyewitness a short time ago, said she saw lots of debris, but nothing very big. The debris is very, very small. People here at the scene say there are no large pieces of debris even left from the plane. Uh, some small fires in the woods, just small brush fires. Um, you know, the ground smoking, um, debris everywhere, pieces of metal, paper, insulation, wiring. Um, and I just looked around and no people. You know, I get up there and I just, I look around, John, and it was like, I mean, like, it's like, where's the plane? You know, I mean, there was just pieces, just small pieces you could pick up and put in the palm of your hand, um, just scattered everywhere. You know, I wondered to myself, where is it? You know, there was just, the plane was just totally disintegrated. Nothing uh, to indicate that, uh, that there was even anybody on the plane. It looked like someone had gouged about a 10 foot wide, 10 foot deep trot through the strip mine area. But when you looked in, it was just covered with dirt. There was nothing there that you could really say was an airplane. Investigators at the scene of the plane crash in Pennsylvania recovered the plane's flight recorder this afternoon. The FBI says the flight recorder has been sent to the National Transportation Safety Board. Within 45 seconds or a minute of impact, we were that we were there. We were there before any firemen, any paramedics, or anybody. We were on site. When we got there, there was a plane flying up above, and he was smart. He flew straight for the sun. So you couldn't you couldn't look at it and see exactly what type of plane or if it was a fighter or what it was, but you know we caught a glimpse of it, and as he was swinging, he was basically traveling in the same direction as the plane. When I got up here almost to the stop sign, this small white plane at the time that's what I thought it was went over top of me. It was so smooth and it just glided right over me, just like that, and then I ducked. And when I looked up again, then it was the um, the spoiler, which is what I call it. And it was tipped like this, so I could really see the spoiler. And then it just banked to the right and went over and went down behind the streets. We got to watching it on TV, and they kept saying that it was a large plane, like a 757. And I was like, mm, no. What I saw was no, no jet. You know, that would have blown me off the road went over me you know that close I said, no, that wasn't it so um, like I said about 1130 that night the FBI came wanted to talk to me um, they kept asking me how big the plane was I said the plane you know it was small wasn't much bigger than my van that I saw and, and that it went over top of me and he says you don't know what a 757 looks like and I said you know don't be condescending to me you know, if you don't want to believe me, that's fine. But what I saw, I thought I should report. And you ought to know there was something else in the air at the same time this was going on. And you want to make sure that maybe it was ours and not somebody else's. And then that's when he, he did seem to get a little nicer. Told me that it was um, a white Learjet. Someone was taking pictures. I said, before the crash? And he says, well, we got to go. And that was the end of it. It was no wider than my van. It was pure white. There was not any markings on it. There was no, um, I, there was no rivets. I mean, it was that close that I could have seen it. It was so molded. It looked like it was all one piece. I'm coming up here, almost to the stop sign, and this, I keep calling it a plane for lack of any other. It, it came down. I mean, it was like right right above my van you know right down over my windshield because it was so low that I ducked in my van and it came right over top of me and I thought it was gonna hit the van because I juked because I saw it and so I stopped and it pulled down a little bit and then it, there's trees right there in front of me and it went right up over the trees and went over real close to the trees because I, I just had to think this is gonna crash I'm gonna see this plane crash and all of a sudden there was the big explosion everybody vor den Kopf gestoßen, weil sie zu einem Flugzeugabsturz gerufen wurden. Aber da war kein Flugzeug. And there's no airplane. You lived here, are you Yes. No airplane. Flugzeug. Just. No. Aber da ist nichts zu sehen. The plane has Das Flugzeug hat sich total zerlegt. Puff. Es krachte auf den Boden und löste sich auf. 
completely. Airplane debris? Nothing I could identify. They were very, very secretive. Sehr, sehr verschwiegen. Sie haben die Sache sehr verschwiegen gehandhabt. Sie haben uns auch dort nicht geholfen, wo es sogar Ihnen Geheimhaltung war das Gebot der The reason why it's so hard for investigators to find out what happened here is because there's practically nothing left of the aircraft. That crater you see behind me where all of those workers are is the point of impact where the plane fell from the sky. And that is all that is left. That is where United Flight 93 crashed into the earth and nearly vaporized. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. The hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. Officials found a passport belonging to one of the terrorists. That was apparently found a couple of blocks away because when uh, one of the planes, or the first plane, slammed into the uh, tower, you could see it on the video, in fact, debris flew out the other end. Uh, there's a belief that some of the cockpit just kept on going and with that velocity went right through the building. Uh, sources here on the ground have told me that they even found uh, some body parts uh, in the cockpit area. Uh, they believe that it is the ter one of the terrorist bodies from the cockpit because the clothing did not, did not match uh, clothing of airline uh, pilots. Not far from here, a passerby found the passport of one of the hijackers. In the rubble outside the World Trade Center towers, we are told rescue workers have recovered a passport and the debris. It belonged to one of the dead hijackers. You have two 110-story office buildings. You don't find a desk. You don't find a chair. You don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. The building collapsed to dust. It was revealed that the uh, passport, stand by and listen to this, the passport of one of the suspected hijackers on that plane that flew into the towers was found blocks away from the World Trade Center crash site. Somehow the passport survived, nobody else did, unfortunately. Also Saturday at a news conference, it was revealed that investigators, uh, searchers, have found something of interest, the passport of one of the suspected hijackers. That passport somehow survived, floating down from above. It was found some distance from the World Trade Center crash site itself. A couple of blocks away from the World Trade Center site, apparently where that passport was found, uh, the FBI announcing that it has found the passport of one of the hijackers who were on, who was on board one of those two planes that hit the twin towers. The body of a uh, of a man believed to be one of the terrorists was found in uh, the cockpit ruins. That is because we're told uh, he was dressed not in pilot's clothes, was not in a uh, uniform of a commercial pilot, but some other clothes. So it could be a body of one of the terrorists. Also, some chilling news: a body uh, of a flight attendant also. Uh, uh, I'm told, has apparently been recovered. Uh, the flight attendant's hands were bound in the back by a wire. Uh, that would uh, then, of course, seem to indicate that the hijackers bound by wire, the flight attendants uh, with their hands behind their backs, which could provide one reason why uh, they were uh, not able or did not uh, put up a fight and were uh, basically relegated to one part of the plane. Items found since the attack include a passport apparently belonging to one hijacker. There is new evidence of the fear on board the aircraft. Sources close to the investigation now say the remains of a second person have been found with their hands tied. Another pair of hands bound together were found earlier. Uh, in fact, the passport for one of the hijackers was found some three or four blocks away. If you look at this, you wouldn't believe you could find anything. The FBI tells NBC News it was some distance from ground zero that a civilian found a passport lying on the street belonging to one of the suspected hijackers. I haven't seen any evidence. I, I've seen no evidence today that said this country could have prevented the attack. No, I know, I know. Well, listen, there's all kinds of speculation. As I said, I have seen no evidence that would have led me to believe that we could have prevented the attacks. And obviously, if we could have, we would have prevented the attacks. Whether you had advanced knowledge of 9-11, do you agree or disagree with the RNC that this kind of rhetoric borders on political hate speech? Yeah. Uh, look, there's time for politics. And, uh, you know...
it's time for politics, and uh, I, uh, it's an absurd situation. Never did in anybody's thought process about how to protect America did we ever think that uh, the evildoers would fly not one, but four commercial aircraft into precious U.S. targets. Never. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings on such a massive scale. Uh, but that turns out not to be true. U.S. military planners did envision and practice those very scenarios. There were people in the United States who actually were preparing to defend against the kind of attacks which occurred here on 9-11. The North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD for short, has been defending the skies over the U.S. and Canada for almost 50 years, 46 to be precise. USA Today reports that in the two years before the attacks on September the 11th, NORAD conducted exercises using hijacked airliners as weapons. And one target was the World Trade Center. Conducted exercises with fighter jets simulating hijacked planes flown into the World Trade Center in the two years before the attacks. Pentagon planners also envisioned the attack on the Pentagon five months before it happened. Air Force officials wanted a war game, having a terrorist group hijack a commercial airline and fly it into the Pentagon. We've been preparing for this kind of event for nearly a decade. We looked at this scenario, hijacked aircraft flying into buildings back in the 60s. A couple of months before September 11th, we know that there was a, a, a planning session uh, by NORAD where military officials considered a scenario in which a hijacked foreign commercial airliner flew into the Pentagon. Months before, NORAD had already in the works plans uh, to simulate in an exercise a simultaneous hijacking of two planes in the United States. Personnel were expecting an exercise that day. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York and we need you guys to, we need someone to scramble some F-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise manifest. One shocking element coming from the tapes, a hijacking exercise was planned the same day. Is that real world? Real world hijacking. No, this is real world. I've never seen so much real world stuff happen during an exercise. This is a real world. I guess, yeah, we're trying to confirm this. I think we put the exercise on the hold. What do you think? I hope they cancel the exercise because this is ridiculous. They just the exercise? Uh, not at this time, no. What we need you to do right now is to terminate all exercise inputs coming in. The question was, we had four war games going on on September 11th. Whether or not the activities of the four war games going on on September 11th actually impaired our ability to, to respond to the attacks. Uh, the answer to the question is no, did not impair our response. Did that help in terms of were more people prepared or did this hurt in terms of people thinking no, there's no possibility uh, that this is real world. We're, we're engaged in an exercise and delay things. Sir, uh, my, my belief is that, uh, is that it helped. We were in the middle of a NORAD exercise at that particular time, asking on the way to my staff, is this part of the exercise? On this morning, they are in the midst of a full-scale training exercise. First thing that went through my mind was, is this part of the exercise? Is this some it's kind of a screw-up? We had multiple aircraft called hijacked all over the country. We got many aircraft calls inbound uh, that morning that turned out to be uh, phantoms. President Bush was quick to use 9-11 to build up his image. At the same time, he is refusing to cooperate fully with the commission investigating the attacks on America. The co-chair of the 9-11 commission itself admits to us that the process he headed up was seriously flawed. So there are all kinds of reasons. We thought we were set up to fail. We got started late. We had a very short time frame. Indeed, we had to get it extended. Uh, we did not have enough money. They were, fa they were afraid we were going to hang somebody, that we would point the finger. The commission in many ways was set up to fail because we had um, not enough money. We didn't have enough time. We had been appointed by the most partisan people in Washington. Now I'm a member of the commission. The president has said, 
only a minority of the commission can see a minority of the documents and then they have to clear what they're going to say to the rest of the commission with the white house it's, it's a scam it's absolutely disgusting at least two of those members uh, said uh, that they were set up to fail by the bush administration one of them max cleland resigned citing this is a national scandal um, this is pretty extraordinary evidence. In fact, the attorney for the 9-11 Commission, John Farmer, cited that there was a, a decision at some point not to tell the American people the truth. Are there really great secrets that you know that you can't share with people? Yeah. Yeah, there are. Uh, and you never write about them. No. It, maybe at a time in your life that no. you're like, oh, I'm 90, I'm going to do it. No. No, nothing. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so sacred we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322. <laughs> <laughs> I had, was sitting outside uh, the, the, the classroom waiting to go in, and I saw an airplane hit the tower of a, of a TV. You know, the TV was obviously on, and I, I used to fly myself, and I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. And uh, it said it must have been a, been a horrible accident. When we walked in the classroom, uh, I had seen this uh, plane fly into the first building. There was a TV set on. In August of 1998, the intelligence community obtained information that a group of unidentified Arabs planned to fly an explosive-laden plane from a foreign country into the World Trade Center. The intelligence community obtained information that Osama bin Laden's next operation could possibly involve flying an aircraft loaded with explosives. He is a 9-11 survivor, the last person out of the World Trade Center North Tower. Well, on September 11th, William Rodriguez saved an estimated hundreds of people from the World Trade Center after putting his own life on the line. He then became trapped under the debris from the tower for hours before rescuers managed to free him from the rubble. I worked in the building for 20 years. I was the person in charge of all the stairwells of the North Tower. And on 9-11, I had the only master key that opened the doors that rescue people. This is the master key. They call wow. it the key of hope. And uh, uh, basically, I was a janitor. Like I said, on that day, there was an explosion on the basement. And uh, this is prior to the building got hit by the plane. And then the plane hit, and then there was a serious of uh, explosions afterwards. I think a bomb went off in the lobby first, then a plane hit the building, then another plane hit the other building. The ladies that are with me were in the World Trade Center on the, on, in the first building and escaped through the lobby where they report they believe there was a bomb in the lobby. The bomb hit the lobby first and a couple of seconds in the first plane hit. Well, you've been to the White House five times. You've been honored by the president, President Bush. You've met Hillary Clinton. Th that must have been quite an honor for you. It was an experience, uh, definitely. And at that time, I was basically uh, loaded to go into politics because they said this is the guy that we need to get the Latino vote. And I was playing the whole game of politics because I was doing the activism and uh, until the moment that I started to ask questions about what really happened on 9-11 and you may remember the whole thing about the 9-11 Commission uh, right. to be formed and uh, basically became very active to get it uh, basically started and uh, what a surprise I, I was right. one of the person that testified for the 9-11 Commission and my testimony doesn't appear on the final report. Willie I could talk to you until 11 o'clock tonight when we go off the air, but we are, uh, unfortunately have to wrap it up. Basically what I'm doing is uh, telling the people what really happened on 9-11 because right. there's a lot of disinformation about what happened. That at the same time two planes hit the building, that there, that the FBI most likely thinks that there was a car or truck packed with explosives underneath the buildings which also exploded at the same time and brought both of them down. Now that's the first time we're hearing that. So two planes and explosives that were in the building. Anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this you have to get at the at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down this was clearly the the, the way the structure is collapsing this was the result of something that was planned this is not it's not accidental that the first tower just happened to collapse and then the second tower just happened to collapse in exactly the same way. How they accomplished this, we don't know. Federal agencies that were down there do believe that there was some sort of explosive device 
somewhere else besides the planes hitting. Started one. Four by four, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had deadly, deadly. Yeah, no, they were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. That was an incredible explosion. Uh, and that does not cause from a, it could have been something that was planted. Or, or a bomb planted yeah, in the right. building, yeah. Is it possible that just a plane crash could have collapsed these buildings? Or would it have required the sort of prior positioning of other explosives in the building? I am reasonably sure that it was not the impact of the plane the one that did this. The entire building has just collapsed as if a demolition team set off when you see the old demolitions of these old buildings. And there may have been secondary explosions as well that were detonated in the building by these terrorists. There may have been something else that brought those buildings down. There was a lot of talk there in New York of, a, of a, another explosion prior to the collapse of the first building. Since that time we know that another bomb was set off at World Trade Center. It looks We're like speculating another here, explosion. possibly a, a bomb? It just looked like an explosion below the, uh, below the, the, where it was burning, and then it just came down. Below the fire, I saw from the corner, boom, 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 boom. Just like 20 straight hits just went down and then I just saw the whole the whole building just went oh, and as the bombs were gone people just started running and I sat there and watched it just started going pop it just started going boom 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 and he goes how fast I go like firecrackers was the plane loaded with explosives uh, was the plane enough in and of itself to crash in the building to bring those uh, two towers down because you'll see the video and, and you've seen it a hundred times it looked like it was a controlled implosion. It didn't fall over. Mm -hmm. It looked as if somebody put TNT all throughout that building. It pancaked from floor to floor to floor. Yes. So, of course, there's speculation here that maybe the, these planes were loaded with C4 explosives or some type of explosives on timers. That if the plane itself didn't bring it down, that charges would go off. It was a secondary explosion, probably a device either planted before or on the aircraft that did not explode until an hour later. A secondary device, that is another bomb going off. Uh, he tried to get his men out as quickly as he could, but he said that there was another explosion which took place. And then an hour after the first hit here, with the first crash that took place, he said, uh, there was a, another explosion that took place uh, in one of the towers here. Uh, so obviously, he, according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. One of the secondary devices he thinks that took place after the initial impact was, uh, he thinks, may have been on the plane that crashed into one of the towers. The second device he thinks, he speculates, was probably planted in the building. Uh, so that's what we have been told by um, Albert Turry, who is the uh, Chief of Safety for the New York City Fire Department. Whether that explosion was caused from the initial impact of the plane or whether it was something that was exploded on the ground, generally speaking, for a building to collapse in on itself like that would seem to indicate that there could have been an explosion, a bomb planted on the ground that would make the building collapse within itself. Another explosion at the World Trade Center. Apparently, bombs may have been placed at the base of those buildings. There was a huge explosion at the base of the South Tower. There was another explosion in the in the basement or one of the lower levels of the uh, of the World Trade Center. We had that big explosion from much much lower. We've heard reports of secondary explosions after the aircraft impacted. Whether in fact there wasn't something else at the base of the towers that in fact were the coup de grace to bring them to the ground. All of their plans came together on this point where they could hijack to certain planes, they could plant they could plant car bombs. I spoke with some police officials moments ago, Chris, and they told me that they have reason to believe that one of the explosions at the World Trade Center, aside from the ones that may have been caused by the impact of the plane with the building, may have been caused by a van that was parked in the building that may have had some type of explosive device in it. So their fear is that there may have been explosive device planted either in the building or in the adjacent area. A bomb went off and uh, a, a fireball must have shot right up the street. Police uh, believe that uh, there were bombers that were in the area after the plane hit the towers planting bombs. CNN is now reporting that there was a third explosion at the World Trade Center, probably an explosion from the ground that caused World Trade Center 1 to collapse on top of itself. Again, there was a third explosion. It's unclear what caused it, whether it was a bomb or whether the first plane that crashed into the tower had somehow been booby-trapped 
with a bomb that was timed to explode later after the crash had occurred. But CNN is reporting that there was a third explosion that caused World Trade Center 1 to collapse within itself. We could hear a rumble, which was uh, about five seconds long, preceding the actual collapse, and then a boom uh, when each of those towers collapsed. There were numerous secondary explosions taking place in that building. It was con there were continuous explosions. I don't think anybody was thinking the buildings might fall. We'd been told that these buildings were tested for a 707 and, and all of that. I mean, good grief. Of course, we didn't think it was going to fall. The building was designed to have a fully loaded 707 crash into it. That was the largest plane at the time. I believe that the building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners. An aircraft crashing into the World Trade Center would probably not do anything to the major building. It could affect localized structural elements, but as far as a plane knocking a building over of that type, that would not happen. We designed the buildings to take the impact of the Boeing 707 uh, hitting the building at any location. A fire broke out last night in the World Trade Center. The fire began in an electrical wiring closet on the 11th floor. The fire spread to six other floors. There was also no sprinkler system in the building. Even without a sprinkling system, fire department officials and building officials here say that there's no chance the World Trade Center could become a type of towering inferno. They concluded that if an aircraft hit, that the buildings would not collapse, that they would be able to take that hit and stand up. We had designed the project for the impact of the our largest airplane of its time, that is to take this jet airplane, run it into the building, destroy a lot of structure, and still have it stand up. The purpose of the military is to, to, to start wars and change governments. It's not to sort of deter conflict. We're going to invade countries. And, I, I, you know, my mind was spinning. They wanted us to destabilize the Middle East, turn it upside down. Now, did anybody ever tell you that? Was there a national dialogue on this? Did senators and congressmen stand up and denounce this plan? Was there a full-fledged American debate on it? Absolutely not. And there still isn't. I was leaving the Pentagon and an officer from the Joint Staff called me into his office and said, I, I want you to know, he said, sir, we're going to attack Iraq. And I said, why? He said, we don't know. He said, uh, I said, well, did they tie Saddam to 9-11? He said, uh, no. And then I came back to the Pentagon about six weeks later. I saw the same officer. I said, why, uh, why haven't we attacked Iraq? We still going to attack Iraq? He said, oh, sir. He says, it's worse than that. He said, um, he pulled up a piece of paper off his desk. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office. It says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. It was a pretty stunning thing. You mean the purpose of the military is to, to, to start wars and change governments? It's not to sort of deter conflict? We're going to invade countries, and, I, I, you know, my mind was spinning. And uh, I put that aside. It was like a nugget that you hold on to. This country was taken over by a group of people with a policy coup. Wolfowitz and Cheney and Rumsfeld and you could name a half dozen other collaborators from the Project for a New American Century. They wanted us to destabilize the Middle East, turn it upside down, make it under our control. In their defining document, written in September of 2000, a full year before 9-11, they acknowledged that the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one. Absent, in their own chilling words, some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. One year later, that event would arrive. A 76-page white paper circulating for a year and arguing for an aggressive U.S. foreign policy suddenly gained new relevance. In the blueprint, it says the process of transformation is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Was 9-11 your Pearl Harbor? I think it was the country's Pearl Harbor. So, what happened? 
while September 11th happened, obviously, and George W. Bush had to rethink. But for many of those around Bush, there was no rethink. There didn't have to be. Long before September 11th, a small, influential group of neoconservatives here in Washington had wanted to see the United States transformed into a sort of benevolent ruler, unchallenged, astride the world. And long before George W. Bush was elected, they sat down and they wrote down a manifesto. The document was effectively a charter of the Project for a New American Century, a neoconservative think tank in Washington. The founding members included Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, uh, Wolfowitz, Paul Wolfowitz of the Defense Department, uh, Richard Pearl, head of the uh, Defense Advisory Board, um, Louis Libby, Cheney's chief of staff, uh, very, uh, John Bolton, Under Secretary of State for uh, Arms Control, uh, Ali Cohen, uh, who's on the Defense Policy Board. Much of what these men wanted is coming true. They urged that the U.S. abandon the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. It has. They wanted establishment of more permanent U.S. military bases abroad. That is happening in the Philippines and in Georgia and will likely happen in Iraq. They urged regime change as a goal of foreign wars, not just in Iraq. They wanted the U.S. as a global constabulary, their word, unburdened by the U.N. or world opinion, preventing any challenge to U.S. dominance. But, they wrote, a year before September 11th, such aspirations are unlikely to be realized without a catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. This is being seen on Capitol Hill as another Pearl Harbor. Some senators have described this as a second Pearl Harbor. This will go down as a kind of Pearl Harbor of terrorism. In the long view of history, it may be that September 11th, 2001, will be remembered as the day America's new century began. He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. If you were Iran, you'd probably believe that you were mostly already at war with the United States anyway, since we've asserted that their government needs regime change. So, uh, and we've asked Congress to appropriate $75 million to do it, and we are supporting terrorist groups, apparently, who are infiltrating and blowing up things inside Iraq, Iran. And if we're not doing it, let's put it this way, we're probably cognizant of it and encouraging it. So it's not surprising that we're moving to a point of confrontation and crisis with Iran. Seeing it come true, it's, uh, it's unfolding. What does that say to the larger extent of everything? Um, it says that the United States needs to be a strong force for peace and justice, global cooperation in the world. Do you have anything else you want to say about that talk or any information that came across? And how do you feel Obama's handling Syria right now? The project for the new American century. Written a year before 9-11, it's supported by key members of the current Bush administration. It says if we are going to transform America into tomorrow's dominant force, that's their phrase, then it's going to be a long process unless there is a catastrophic and catalyzing event, dash like Pearl Harbor. Tower 1 and Tower 2. A large portion of it filled New York, filled the air, went everywhere. And it looks pretty uniform in size, except for the paper. Landed on the fruit. It's like a fresh snow. Here's a view from the north. What covered the wheat checks was aluminum cladding which you can see those pieces falling off, but they don't trail dust. But the steel wheat checks trail dust. This is an interesting. This is a rather large 
we check's falling here with dust shooting out behind it. Is the building just turning to dust? Why? This is tower two closer to the ground. Do you see any solid pieces of building coming down? I don't. I see aluminum cladding falling, but the rest is this type of dust. Here are four consecutive shots, and you can see these columns just turn to dust. Here's a video clip, and you can watch this turn to dust. So is this what happened to the entire building? Perhaps. Let's look at it a little bit more carefully. These core columns that were left standing for whatever reason are strong and rigid. That's an, a very tall, unsupported column. And the next frame it starts to tip, and then it turns to dust. Before it even tips over. Stuff he's pulling out. What was that, Chief? You're gonna hold, we're gonna hold off on the water. See the stuff he's pulling out? Yeah. It's red hot. Another interesting phenomenon is toasted cars. A large number of toasted cars. Um, I, I don't mean just a few burnout cars. I mean this, this weird things happening that don't make sense. After Tower 1 was destroyed, that's the second tower that was destroyed, suddenly these cars were on fire. There's mountains of paper in between, large volumes of paper that didn't burn. Why are these cars over here on fire when nothing between the tower and the car is? This is West Broadway. So what happened on that street? Here's a top view of that same street. This aggressive cloud looks like it did something unique. Because all the vehicles along this street were toasted. Maker's Trust across the street had some interesting events occur. This building, according to FEMA, had no fires in it. What happened to this beam? That's not from a mechanical overload. This was a horizontal beam supporting the floors. Why would it shrivel up that way like uh, you would curl a ribbon for a package. A chemical signature of nuclear fusion is tritium, the radioactive isotope of hydrogen. Tritium levels 55 times higher than normal were found in the sewer water below ground zero. There was a weapon in play that day that I don't even know what it is, but it's, I can equate it to being like a microwave. You know how you can take a piece of chicken and put it on a paper plate and stick it in the microwave and the chicken will burn, but the paper plate won't? Yes. Well, something.
something happened that day equivalent to a microwave. Ground Zero fumed for over 100 days through rainstorms, freezing temperatures, and constant watering. Judy Wood identifies the effect as ongoing molecular dissociation. Imagining that a skyscraper or any object can crush itself into dust under its own weight is cartoon physics. Several other people keep asking us, when you look at where the towers used to stand, there is surprisingly so little rubble. Where did all the rubble well, go? It's a very good question, Peter, and I have asked some people who've been doing some of the rescue and recovery work this morning. If you look behind me, you can see the very remains, the skeletal remains of the World Trade Center. And one volunteer, Robert Gerlinski, explained to me the reason there's so little rubble is that all of it simply fell down into the ground and was pulverized, evaporated. It just blew up, a big explosion, people started running, it was just chaos everywhere. No second flight, it was the bomb. Bomb it in all the building, not second plane. That was the bomb. Right. Who said the second plane? That's what we're told, the second plane. No, we saw it on I television. Know everything. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, this is the first one went off, and then 10 minutes later, this just blew up out of nowhere. Well, tell me about that plane. Well, I didn't recognize it as a plane at first. It, I, I had thought that there was an explosion from within the Trade Center. From my perspective, I didn't know that it was an airplane that hit the building. I, I still thought it was a bomb, and everything I saw told me it was, it was bombs in, in the building. And there is the very interesting case of David Hanshu. Mr. Hanshu is a professional photographer for the New York Daily News. He took a famous photo of the South Tower right after United 175 supposedly flew right into this wall. I was underneath it. I was looking at the tower, I had my camera in my hand, I heard the noise, I never saw the airplane. I was less than 100 yards away from the building, I was standing on West Street. He had this view. Each image in the flight path is separated by one second. David Hanshu would have been able to see the plane for at least six seconds he would have been able to hear it coming for considerably longer than that. I had no idea what it was, and then the South Tower just exploded. It just, it just, it just blew up. It just blew up, a big explosion. He bombed it in the building, not second plane. I had thought that there was an explosion from within the Trade Center. News reporters at the scene also seem to have missed the plane. The plane that was exploding right next to Just I didn't to see a plane go in. That that just exploded. News anchors watching monitors were quick to correct them. I just saw another plane coming in from the side. It's easy to see how the television audience could be fooled. And a lot of eyewitnesses could be manufactured. Scripted actors. Shills. I saw this plane come out of nowhere and just scream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. There was a weapon in play that day that I don't even know what it is, but it's, I can equate it to being like a microwave. You know how you can take a piece of chicken and put it on a paper plate and stick it in the microwave and the chicken will burn, but the paper plate won't? Yes. Well, something happened that day equivalent to a microwave. The towers didn't burn up. Nor did they slam to the ground. They turned into dust in midair, 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 midair. Can I ask you a question about some of the technology that you're developing to fight the war on terror, specifically directed energy and high-powered microwave technology? Do you, uh, when do you envision that you can weaponize that type of technology? Mm -hmm. Goodness. Um, it is. It is in, for the most part, the kinds of things you're talking about are in varying early stages. Do you want to give anything you'd add? I don't think I would add much. I, mm -hmm. I, it's, I think they are in early stages and 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 probably not ready uh, for employment at this point. The, the, in in the normal order of things, when you invest in research and development and begin a developmental project, 
uh, you don't have any intention or expectations that one would use it. Uh, on the other hand, the real world intervenes from time to time and you reach in there and take something out that is still in a developmental stage and you might use it. So it, the ans I, it's not, your question is not answerable. It, is, it, is, uh, it depends on what happens in the future and how, how well things move along the track and whether or not someone feels it's appropriate to reach into a development stage and see if something might be useful, as was the case with the unmanned aerial vehicles. But you sound like you're willing to experiment with it. I, I think that's the point. And I think, and it's, we, we have, I think, from the beginning of this conflict, I think General Franks has been very open to looking at uh, new things if there are new things available and has been been willing to, to put them into the fight even before they've been fully <laughs> wrung out. And I think that's uh, not referring to these two particular cases of directed energy or, or high-powered microwave, uh, but, but sure. time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. In the heart of this great city, we saw tragedy arrive on a quiet morning, September the 11th. September the 11th. September the 11th. September 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 11th, 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 September 11th, September 11th. September 11th, September 11th. September 11th. September 11th, September 11th, 2001. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Saddam 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 Hussein. Continuing danger, hour of danger. Very, very dangerous world. A grave new threat. Horrific acts of atrocities. Murderous regimes dedicating to killing us. Tyranny and terror. Slaughtered thousands. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons programs. The deadliest of weapons. Terrible weapons. Nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. Poison gas, torture chambers, mass graves, deadly technologies, radical ideology of hate, terror of threats, terror, 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 war on terrorism, war against terrorism, global war on terror, global terrorism, 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 terrorism. 
the evil terrorists. Terrorists, 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 terrorists. The right track is don't believe anybody. Okay. Don't believe me. Don't believe George Bush. Don't believe anyone. You got to go out and you got to get proof in your hand before you can believe anything. And to do otherwise today is, is the biggest mistake that anyone could ever make. Um, you begin believing people, uh, putting your trust in them that they're telling you the truth, I guarantee you you're going to take a ride on a roller coaster you don't want to be on. Here's the takeaway, my friends. The government is not going to keep you safe. The government is putting you in danger. The government is presiding over a collapse in school standards. The government is presiding over and paying for, in many ways, the drugging of very young children with very dangerous drugs. The government has displaced private and personal and voluntary methodologies for keeping people safe, which is keeping tabs on your neighbors, having chats, having good relationships with the police, making sure that everything is followed through. There is this kind of, you know, throw the ball of responsibility over the fence and never follow up because the government is now perceived to be taking care of communities. Well, the government is not taking care of communities in Sweden. The government is not taking care of communities in South Africa. The government is not taking care of communities and young women in England. The government is not taking care of you. You are, to the government, tax livestock, to be programmed, to be exploited, and to be lied to and bribed into voting for surrendering your own freedoms. Uh, free stuff in, re in return for freedoms, and the free stuff will pass, and the loss of freedoms will be permanent. The government is not your friend. The government is not your pal. The government is not your father. The government is not your husband. The government is not just. It is not fair. The government is force. The government is the only agency able to legally initiate the use of force against you, usually legally disarmed citizens. The government is coercion. The government is fire. It is a very dangerous servant and an entirely tyrannical master. And as long as the government continues to grow, your safety will continue to shrink.